Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Do you want to experience God? That is to say, dwell with His presence. Experience all of His goodness in your life that produces that which is pleasing to Him. Now, my hope is to all those questions, you will give a strong affirmation that you want to be with God, that you want God to be present in your life. The question is, how? How can I ensure that I'm going to experience God, that He will be in my circumstances, and I will be in His presence? Well, David, in Psalm 15, gives us great counsel and how to make that a reality. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to that psalm, Psalm 15. And in essence, when I read this and some of the vocabulary that we're going to encounter, we see that really what this psalm speaks of is a Torah-observant life, the benefit out of applying God's truth to one's life. You want intimacy with God. You want to be in his presence. You want him actively involved in your circumstances. Then live a life that is based upon his truth. But how do I do that? That's exactly what Psalm 15 reveals. So let's begin. Verse 1. A Psalm of David. And David, of course, whenever we come across that word, even though here the writer, the author of this psalm and so many others is literally David, the son of Yeshai, King David, but it also has a messianic understanding, meaning this. What David writes in the psalms reveals to us frequently how to live a messianic-inspired life, how to live and what is required for a a life that reflects the messianic age. Let me say that differently. A life that reflects the kingdom. And over and over, that's what you hear me say. That we're supposed to live in a way that demonstrates, that bears testimony of our faith in the kingdom of God and the king of that kingdom. His spirit dwells within us and his spirit leads us illuminates our mind so we make kingdom-based decisions, decisions that manifest the foundation of kingdom life, kingdom behavior. So, a psalm of David, and David begins with a question, a few questions, and he addresses them to the Lord. He says, O Lord, and this is that sacred name of God, that yud Hey vav Hey, those four letters. And one of the reasons why this name appears here, not simply God, not simply Adon, referring to another word that can be translated Lord, but this sacred name of God, the name that transcends all things, the name that is not rooted in time, for he is the God that was and is and will be. And one of the things that we glean from his name being used here is that the truth, the principles, what God is revealing in this psalm, they are true always. They are not limited to certain periods of times or situations. They are universal. They transcend all things, culture, ethnicity, whatever, this is truth always. Verse 1, O Lord, who will dwell or reside? And this is the word for dwelling someplace, living someplace. And he asked, 
who will dwell in your tent. Now, tent, remember, Moses, during his leadership in the wilderness, the tabernacle was sent up, which is called Ohel Moed. So tent has to do with God in a unique way, his dwelling presence, his sanctuary, the place that he abides. So what David is saying here in this first part of verse 1 is, how does one dwell with you? Dwell in your presence. How does one enter into your tent to experience you? And then he asks it another way. He says, and who will dwell? And this is a word. Remember, I mentioned tabernacle. And one of the ways to speak of the tabernacle, and this is what I meant when I said Ohel Moed, the word Ohel is tent, the tent of meeting, Ohel Moed. But there's another term for the tabernacle, and that is Mishkan. And it comes from the word Lishkon. Hear the similarity, Mishkan and Lishkon. It comes from the Hebrew word, which means to dwell. It is a synonym for Ligur, Lishkon means basically the same thing. But this word also reflects a, a closeness to the presence of God. Why is that? Because one of the ways that we refer to God's presence is with the term shchina. Shchina is the dwelling. But whenever we say shchina, we, need the, we mean the dwelling presence of God. So he says, and who will dwell in your holy mountain? Now, of course, this is a reference to Jerusalem, but, but pay attention for a moment to that word mountain. Mountain also reflects a, a degree of authority, a seat of government or power. So when he says, who will dwell in your holy mountain? It can also be understood who is going to submit to your holy authority. And submitting to the holy authority of God means I affirm and I apply to my life God's purposes. Remember, holiness, the purposes of God. So right here, he gives us great insight. If we want to experience God's presence, if we want to be close, intimate with him, if we want to have access to his resources, then we need to be committed to his purposes. And we need to realize it's not saying, God, uh, over here, I'm here, come and be with me. But rather, it's dwelling with him. I need to make the change. I need to reposition myself. And the only way to do that is applying this principle. God I want to submit to your authority, so I take hold, I embrace your purposes. Verse 2. He also answers this question in this way. Verse 2. Holech tamim. Who walks, who goes, it's a word of, of life. Who lives, and notice this next word, tamim. Now, that word can be translated innocent. It can be translated blameless or pure, but, but let's talk about the root of what it's saying. This word reflects a purity or an innocence that is derived from relying upon God, trusting Him. I shared with you that this word, uh, here it's tamim, but this word can also, a tam can be a blameless person, but also a simpleton, a fool. And what it's trying to say to us is this. A fool doesn't know very much. He doesn't know how to, to order his life. It's, if it's raining, he doesn't know to walk in out of the rain. Someone has to help him, tell him, instruct him. And so in the biblical sense, this same word is used for one that understands when it comes to the spiritual. When it comes to the things of God, I'm a simpleton. I don't understand them. These things, these principles, I can't, can't latch on to. I can't understand in and of myself. 
compared to the laws, the ways of God, my mindset, I'm foolish in regard to those. And the only way that I can embrace them if, is if I rely upon God. I trust him. I say, God, just like that one who doesn't know enough to get out of the rain, someone has to help him. I turn and I acknowledge my inadequacy that I am, when it comes to spiritual truth, I'm foolish. Therefore, I have to have help, assistance. I'm in need of him. I make myself dependent. I rely, I trust upon him. And when a simpleton does that, that action, that trust, that reliance upon God turns him into one who is blameless, one who is innocent before God. So we need to have when it says, Holech Kamim. This is someone who walks, who conducts himself, understanding his absolute dependence, that he needs to rely totally upon the truth of God, the ways of God, the assistance the help of God. And when he does that, notice the next part, u for el sedek. The first word in this phrase, poel, means it's a word of action, of doing, of behavior. So it's one, when one relies, trusts, makes oneself dependent upon God, he will act, he will behave, he will do that which is, and notice it, righteous. So relying upon God produces righteousness in my life. Living innocently, not violating the things of God, produces righteousness in my life. It not only causes me to make righteous decisions, do that which is righteous, but it's also going to give me a perspective for understanding, for perceiving righteousness. And then the second half of verse 2, Vedover and met Bill Vavo. He speaks truth in his heart. Now, heart, it's just not speaking it, but it's also heart. What should come into our mind? Hope you know the answer to this. I say this so frequently. Heart as a man thinks in his heart. So it's a, a term of meditation, of thinking, reflecting upon what? The truth of God. So we need to realize that it is only when I think according to the truth of God am I going to be someone that experiences God's presence in my life and be brought into close proximity, intimacy with Him. And you can never overestimate the wonderful blessings that come from being brought into intimacy with God. Then verse 3. Verse 3 speaks about what we ought not do. And it says, Lo ragal al lishono. Now, we really have to unpack this because the word ragal, if I said the word miragel, this is a word for spy. But the word regal, a noun from this verb, is foot. And what it has to do with is going someplace, moving someplace, and as a spy does, collecting information. And not just collecting information, but the purpose is to share that. That based upon this information, I'm going to behave. Now, the context here is moving around, remember foot, moving around, gathering information concerning other people. And that should not be, what does he say? Very clearly, we read once more, lo regal al le shono. That such information, as we move about, we should not be individuals that are moving to gather uh, information, spying out, to learn things about others so it can be upon our tongue that we can share it with others. We need to learn, in other words, not to gossip, not to share everything that we hear, but to keep it to ourselves. So one of the things that is very important that we do is that we do not speak information about others 
And notice something else in regard to that. Lo asa la re'ehu. He does not do or make for his neighbor, his friend, ra'ah. And these two things go together, which means this. I don't gather information about someone so that I can make for him that which is evil, that which is not according to God's will. See, learn, that is the behavior of Satan. One of the ways that Satan is spoken of is that he is an accuser. So he loves to gather damaging, embarrassing, shameful information about us. In fact, he just doesn't gather it, but he tries to get us to do it. And when we behave in a shameful way, when we do or act in a way contrary to the things of God, who is there to speak that out, to accuse us? The enemy, Satan. And what he's saying here is that a believer ought not behave this way. This is not the purpose of one who submits to the authority of God, who recognizes God's presence in their life and seeks intimacy with God. This is not what one does. We don't gather information to spread it about so that that evil, that which is not God's will, will happen to this individual. We do not keep reading the end of verse 3, the and cherpa, cherpa is a, a strong word for shame. We have two words that come into my mind right now for shame, busha, ve cherpa. Oftentimes we, we use these two words together to speak about a strong shame or embarrassment and such. And it's saying here, our nature is not that we want to, look at all the verse, and shame. He does not lift up upon, and this is the word krovo, which is usually a family member. The word karo simply means one who is close, one who is near. So he doesn't do it to a friend, and he doesn't do it to anyone around him, whether it's family, whether it's a neighbor, or anyone else, just because he's able to, just because the opportunity, and that's why the word krovo appears there, just because he has the opportunity to shame one. We don't want to do that. That is not our nature. We want to lift people up. We don't want to place shame upon them. We want to behave in a way that they become an instrument that manifests the glory of God, not shamefulness. So it's really clear here what he's saying concerning our behavior. Look at now verse 4. Nibzeh, this is the word that uh, has to do with perhaps despising. That which is re rejectable, meaning we don't want. And what he's saying here, and this is the same thing, same word that, that Esau, when Esau encountered the birthright, he had, uh, uh, he despised the, the birthright. And what it says here, look again, verse 4. A despicable one. In his eyes, he, Nimas, he rejects. So he doesn't see someone who is despicable, and that word has to do with behaving in a way that is shameful, a way that is not proper. He doesn't see this one and is drawn to that, but rather in his eyes, such a person is, is one that he rejects. He doesn't want a relationship. He doesn't want activity with this person. He separates himself from such a one. But, look at the last part of verse 4. But, the one who fears the Lord, what does he do? He honors. So, one who despises the things of God like Esau. And that's what makes one a despicable individual. He rejects the things of God. And because this one rejects the things of God, we reject him. But the one who fears God, let's say it a different way, the one who makes God his priority in the things of God, the purposes of God, his priority. This one, what did we do? We honor this one. 
we give glory to that one. It's a word for, we see that one as significance. It's a word literally for heaviness. We see a significance for that person, and we behave in this way. And then the end of verse 4. And this is something that uh, I think so, so much related to integrity. And God wants us to be people of integrity. Notice what he says. Nishba. Now, this is someone who has made an oath. Nishba. He has sworn. He has taken an oath. But it says, Nishba lehara. And the implication, according to the sages, is that he's said that he's going to do something, but it's not going to produce something good for him. So I've told, I'll do this. I'll make this uh, donation. I'll uh, uh, do this action. I'll, I'll make this commitment. But then I discover, you know what? If I carry this out, it, it, it's not going to be good for me. Now, what do most people do? Most people say, I'm sorry, I changed my mind. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to do this. Uh, and they don't. But what does scripture say? It doesn't say, you know, I may do that. The person took an oath. He pledged something. And even if it produces something not good with me, if I say, yes, I need to stand by my word. Now, obviously, if we make an agreement to do something that's sinful, we don't carry out sin. But this is something that I've sworn to do something. Remember, it's better not to make an oath. But if we do, even if it has a personally adverse effect, for example, I promise that I'm going to invest in this person's business. I promise him I'm going to do that. Then I learn something that, uh, well, I really shouldn't now, but I've already given my word. You have to give the money. Even if it's going to Bruce produce a negative return, I'm going to lose all that money. Your word is more important. And then the end says, let's just read it all, Nishba le hara, someone swore to his own uh, uh, demise or to his own uh, uncomfortableness or his own misfortune, it says, lo yamir. Yamir, he doesn't change it. This is a word I'm very familiar with this word because if you have uh, foreign currency, you have to lamir le shkalim. You have to uh, convert that money, change that money into uh, shekels. So it's a word for changing, converting. And what he's saying is, you give your word, you don't change your word. You don't turn it into something else. You be people of integrity. And now, verse 5. Now, we gave an example about making a donation, making an investment, money. He's going to talk more about money in this last verse. Look at verse 5. He says, his money. Now, think that usually very uh, serious when we start talking about money. He says, his money, he does not give at interest. Now we're talking about someone not necessarily investing, not making a donation, but someone is in need of money. And they're asking to borrow it. So someone comes up and says, I'm in a difficult situation, uh, a fellow brother, and uh, can you loan me, let's say, $1,000? Well, you loan that money, but you do not loan it at interest. It is not appropriate for an individual. We're not talking about a bank or a business, a loan company. We're talking about individuals here. An individual does not loan money to a fellow believer or a friend at interest. So he says... His money he does not give at interest. And what else? He's not money-minded. Now, he's a good steward, but he is not given over. Money doesn't rule him. And he says, ve shochad, that's a bribe. He does not, and the implication is, a bribe against an innocent one. And this was done frequently, probably still today, but in the past, 
someone would be innocent and they would make a bribe for an elder to, to rule against this person, to say that he's guilty. And so David says clearly here, don't take a bribe against an innocent person. And then finally it says, those who do these things, this is a summary statement, those who do these things, doing what we ought to do and not doing what we ought not to do. So someone who is faithful to this, that takes these simple principles, not hard to understand, rather easy to understand. Those who do these things, not taking a bribe, not loaning money for interest, doing the things we ought to do. He says, those who do these things, notice, lo yimot leolam. He will not be moved. Now, here's what we see, and it says not be moved ever. It is a, a principle for our seasons, all times, for every situation. When we put these things into practice, doing the things we ought to do and not doing the things we ought not to do, when we embrace that, where are we going to be? In God's presence. And we will not be moved from that. That's what the enemy tries to do. When you are obedient to the things of God, the enemy hates that. And he comes in. He will bring hardship. He will bring uh, uh, difficulties in order to get you to move away from where God wants you to be. But when we remain in that character, in those activities, that behavior, what does the word of God say? We will never be moved. Moved from where? This intimacy, this presence of God, this, this provision that comes from being in the will of God. So this psalm, Psalm 15, it is a simple psalm, but it is so profound meditate upon it. What does that mean? Read it over and over. Pray, oh God, help me to understand this and help me to apply all these things to my life. If you make a commitment to Psalm 15, you can be assured that you are going to have a greater experience with God, greater worship. You are going to be transformed. I'll close with that until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.